Yeah, fine. If you don't hear me, just you can go to sleep and relax. <laughs> relax. Uh, director of the Institute, Excellencies, and all of the friends. First of all, in, uh, thank you for inviting me. I have actually been to, um, to uh, Lithuania uh, six times before. Uh, and I, it's not all places I go where I'm invited back. So I'm very pleased that you invite me to come here. And I'm very pleased to give a short review on the report on Nordic cooperation on foreign and security policy I made. And um, wait, let me, um, you, you see, I'm 80 years old. And when you are 80 years, you can, I can speak according to the manuscript. But so, I quite frequently get ideas, other ideas in. And I like to share with the audience. I speak a lot in associations and centers for the elderly. And when I tell this, the whole group say, yes, we have the same way. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's a sign of being old. Uh, I, I want to share with you briefly one thing. My last task so far has been to chair a group of politicians in Norway uh, uh, on a proposal or recommendation for a new policy on drugs in Norway. And it's very close to my heart uh, because I think it's a terrible thing for, I, I think, all over the world. Young people are dying because of misuse of drugs. And if I and the other people on the group could contribute to a better situation here, I would be very pleased. And I suppose, I haven't checked this, I suppose you have a drug problem in Lithuania too. It's in most countries. But uh, no one of you confirmed this, so maybe you are <laughs> sacred people who do not have this problem. But all over the world, it's a very serious problem. Now, to what I'm asked to talk about. Uh, yes, this is, this, is a, this is a habit of mine. I quite often speak about things I'm not asked to talk about, <laughs> particularly at home, so my family dislike this. Um, let me first make it quite clear that whatever I say here is um, my opinion. Uh, I, I had this rare privilege to be asked by the Nordic governments to write a report on uh, cooperation in foreign and security policy. And um, it was under me. Uh, and I, I, I will tell you, some particularly the young people here, that if you ever get the chance to write the report alone, do it. It's a fantastic privilege. I, 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 I have my whole life, I have been writing reports, looking to my responsibility as member of the government, as uh, active in the party, as uh, Red Cross president, as UN representative, etc. But here, I could stop writing and I could think for myself, and no other concerns. So what I say here, uh, both in the report and what I say to you today here, is my responsibility alone. I um, was asked in uh, June 16th, in, uh, 2008, to make this report. and. Uh, I handed the report over to the Nordic governments in March 2009. And the background for the report is very rare. Um, it was 
a product of an article in Nordic in newspapers by our chief of staffs from Finland, from Sweden, and from Norway. And uh, I, as, as you told, I have been Minister of Defense. I must tell you that I'm not used to uh, new ideas from the Chief of Defense. But here, there were brilliant three persons who come up with the following uh, uh, challenge to the politicians. That the um, cost of high technology will increase dramatically in the years to come. So for small countries in Europe, the question will be, do we manage to cooperate on this very essential issue of defense system? If not, we will slowly reduce the quality of our defense system. And they indicated that if no European countries start cooperating, including Spain, for instance, which is not a small country uh, compared with uh, and the Nordic and the Baltic countries. Then, after around 20 years, there will be modern defense systems in uh, Russia, in Germany, in France, and United Kingdom. The rest of us will have definitely a degraded defense system compared with today. This in itself was, of course, a big challenge to all the Nordic governments. And then, after actually they gave me this mandate to write this report, uh, and I, I would say a new thing came up. Um, I, I, I was foreign minister in '93 when we had the meeting in Kirkenes with the, the Nordic governments and Russia uh, signing the treaty on the Barents Regional Cooperation. At that time, I got a telephone call from my Japanese colleague. And he said to me, why am I not invited? And I said, I told him, well, I regret to tell you that I didn't actually think about you in connection with the Barents region cooperation. And he said, um, you should know about our research. And, uh, and then I invited him to come immediately, and he came. Uh, and the, Japan had done research on uh, transportation by sea from the Pacific to the Barents Sea and Atlantic. Under the ice, below the ice which was a fairly dramatic research and a completely new way of shipping. But the irony in the whole story is that by the time uh, Japan were closer to an end result on this research, to really have ships able to go under the, the ice, uh, the ice was melting. And today, as some of you will know, we have regular shipping from the Pacific to the Atlantic and Barents region by Russian and German ships, but I think there will be Canadians in the years to come as well. And we are certainly, like many others, planning to take part in this shipping and this development of shipping in Norway and I hope in other Nordic countries. So this came as a second pillar in my mandate. Look into what this means also for uh, the Nordic countries and the necess necessity for cooperation between the Nordic uh, 
countries. Um, uh, I uh, I had uh, one absolute ambition, and that was you will be surprised. I have been the recipient of reports quite a, often in my life, but all the reports they sent to me are 300 pages or 400 pages. And I will tell you now, I didn't dare to tell them then, that I didn't read this. No, I, I simply did not have time to read this report. I, 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 I read the summary and it did it went well, because the others in the audience had not read the report either. They have only read the summary. But I think this is madness. So I decided I will make a short report, which everyone who receives the report must read. You cannot come to a meeting discussing Nordic cooperation uh, in foreign and security policy. This report is 35 pages, I repeat, 35 pages, 13 recommendations, lots of pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and so far, people I met who, who deal with this have read the report fully, and, and, and that's much better. Uh, I got some protests from the parliament but uh, they have given in because the next report on, on uh, drugs is also very short. So <laughs> if they ask me again, they will get short reports. Um, <clears throat> uh, um, I um, have now told you that there's 13 recommendations. Out of this there has been a particular uh, debate concerning two of the recommendations. One is the recommendation num number 13 on uh, Nordic solidarity. And let me briefly tell you why I included this. I, had f I believe I had fin finalized my report. 12 recommendations, but then I started to travel around, talking with people all over the Nordic countries, in the north, in the south, in the capitals, and I noticed that everyone in the meetings applauded Nordic cooperation. I didn't meet anyone skeptical to it. But in the evening, after dinner, in the late evening, People were more direct and more frank. I am, I, I, I am the same type. Uh, I get franker later in the night that I'm there. <laughs> then they would say, do you trust the others? We, and this was representative of all the Nordic countries, um, we will live up to these recommendations. But do you think the others will? I'm <clears throat> And, and uh, I, I, I believe they will, because it's a necessity behind this. But this made me reflect on the situation in a family. And it's the same in the Nordic, between the Nordic people. You, I dare not guess what is the case with the Baltic people, but you know that better than, than uh, I do. This is another advice to you. Don't ever speak to an audience about an issue they know much better than you. Uh, it uh, can be a catastrophe. So, so uh, but in the Nordic, between the Nordic people, there is some sort of a family feeling which includes jealousy. And uh, the later in the evening, the more jealous you get. <laughs> and, 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 and this is a problem for the whole Nordic cooperation, always been and still is. Um, uh, I have to speak, I, I believe that the Norwegians will rather be fooled by a Frenchman than by a Swede. 
Uh, and, and the reason is simple. We expect to be fooled by a Frenchman, but we really don't expect to be fooled by a Swede. And that's why we constantly are afraid of being fooled by another Nordic. And this applies not only to Norwegian, this applies to the Nordic people. And this is the most difficult issue we are up against. So for instance, to take it concretely, the question would be the following. How can we go into uh, uh, security cooperation with a country, Nordic country and not be tr not trust that in case we need spare parts, for instance, for artillery, we will get it. And this, in order to um, um, in order to assure or increase the possibilities that this will work in time of crisis, I added the paragraph, the recommendation number thirteen, on solidarity. Uh, to reduce the skepticism between people in the Nordic countries. <clears throat> um, I will also tell you that such a solidarity recommendation, uh, uh, I'm not instead of NATO. We are not mad. Uh, and it's not instead of uh, EU. No, it's in addition to the declaration uh, in, in NATO, Article 5, <coughs> or the, the, the um, uh, EU uh, uh, responsibilities. And, and um, we, we, we will, um, uh, this will strengthen the feeling and of responsibility among all the Nordic countries. And now let me also tell you um, uh, what I think is extremely encouraging. Uh, I, I had no illusions that the work on this 13 recommendation would start early and, and, and turn into action early but it's doing extremely well. The first thing happened when all the Nordic foreign ministers said that they are not against any of the recommendations, but there are some that must be taken before others. That's quite obvious. <clears throat> so I expected the recommendation number 13 to come quite late in the development, but the first thing discussed by the foreign minister was recommendation 13. And they agreed that on all the recommendations, they should go step by step. That means if two of the Nordic countries go for one of the recommendations, we start then with the two. If four of the Nordic countries go for a recommendation, we go on with that. And uh, as of today, both Sweden, uh, Finland, and Norway go for recommendation number 13, solidarity, and Iceland have said that they will definitely follow. Uh, Denmark uh, hesitate, it's a bit hesitant, but we will see. So at least as of today, there are all reasons to believe that the Solidarity Declaration will work for four of the five Nordic countries. Um, uh, yeah, then I must admit, I, I, I think so far I've been basically bragging about this. I've been fairly uh, content, as you understand. But I, I must tell you, when I was planning the report, I didn't know or didn't fully understand how important cyber defense is to people around uh, in the Nordic countries. And uh, this, uh, the, uh, the recommendation on cyber defense 
has become one of the key issues. And I believe that most probably the cooperation on cyber defense will be one of the first recommendations to be followed up in, uh, in, in reality. Um, <clears throat> the recommendation number one on uh, peace forces it came bef because there were um, we had prepared in the Nordic countries long before these recommendations uh, what we believed was helpful for the United Nations. Training, cooperation, exercising, and sending peace forces on the request of United Nations. But it didn't work out. <clears throat> and the United Nations said that what we constructed was not meeting the needs of the United Nations. So what I did was to call Kofi Annan and ask him for his help on this recommendation number one. And Kofi Annan together with his director of um, peace activity in the United Nations helped me with the paragraph one. Now, uh, there has been, as far as I know, no problems for the governments in the Nordic countries to accept and go for uh, this uh, stabilization task force. However, it proves to be fairly expensive to prepare this and have this standing force. So. I think it will take longer time than most expected in the very beginning of this work. And then uh, the, the protection against cyber attacks. It came as uh, proposal number seven, Nordic Resource Network to protect against cyber, uh, cyber attacks. And here, the Nordic countries are actively helping each other and uh, exchanging experience. So it's actually starting up much sooner and much more simple than I feared in the beginning of this work. <clears throat> uh, I know that several of you have experienced this sort of attacks. Uh, in my country, we experienced this in October 2010 in connection with the Nobel Peace Prize for 2010. And you know probably as well as I do that um, the first and foremost, this sort of uh, attacks are trying to uh, block internet uh, pages. That is a relatively mild form for cyber war. It's more serious if the intention is to manipulate data systems. That is essential for important system for our societies. I think about banks, electrical nets, oil pipelines in the North Sea, air and rail traffic. My recommendation is to establish a resource network against cyber attacks. Uh, then, <coughs> uh, we have as, uh, I, I, don't be worried. I will not go through all the 13 recommendations, but I go through those recommendations that have been followed up, and I think with some interesting questions. Uh, uh, no, uh, my proposal number two is Nordic cooperation on surveillance of Icelandic airspace. Um, <clears throat> the background for this is uh, uh, the following. 
you all remember that the Americans left Iceland, and the day after they left, uh, the uh, Russian Air Force came in and uh, had this surveillance around Iceland. And uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Iceland called the Russian ambassador uh, and uh, she said to him that we know that you are not um, uh, uh, violating any international law. We know that you are not violating any bilateral agreements. But you should know that the people of Iceland do not appreciate very much having these Russian planes around the island constantly. And uh, he said, I, I was not there, but I'm told. According to what I'm told, he said that you must get used to this. And this inspired the Nordic countries to, uh, to be much quicker on the reactions than we planned for. So first, Denmark and Norway agreed to take one part of the surveillance together. The, uh, we asked Sweden and Finland, who were a bit hesitant at the beginning, and, but then they agreed to take the two first stages. That means to be trained in the exercise on land in Iceland, and secondly, to take part in, in, in maneuvers on the surveillance. And now I'm pleased to be informed that they are now Finland and Sweden agreed to take their own turn and surveillance of Iceland. So the Nordic countries are all there. And this, I think, means a lot for the solidarity in the, between the Nordic people and, uh, obviously, for, for Iceland. Proposal number three, Nordic Maritime Monitoring System. The fact today is that no Nordic countries has the capability to meet the challenges that two uh, new seaways across the pole opens for us. Um, we, we will, uh, should we help him? Because then it goes quicker. We <laughs> I mean, all of rush out. Um, uh, then uh, we have not the capacity in case of an incident uh, to search or rescue. Now, both Russia, United States, and I believe Canada has said that we shouldn't worry because uh, in the Nordic countries, because they can take care of search and rescue. But uh, I, I don't think any Nordic country feels satisfied with that answer. So what we do now is to prepare uh, a possible building up of uh, capacity for search and rescue in the Barrens. And uh, in my proposal, there is um, uh, a suggestion for monitoring system, both in the Baltic and in the Barrens. And uh, we are building up now something called the Barrens Watch, which should give us the necessary surveillance possibilities. And we have invited for cooperation with the Baltic states and others on the Baltic Sea uh, monitoring system. Uh, then I, I have no special comments to Maritime Response Force. I have no common specialty to a, a satellite system for surveillance and communications, except one. Uh, we need, at, when I say we know, I, I, I mean at least the Nordic countries in the north. We need satellite system. 
because uh, some of you may know the traditional uh, systems work to the 71st parallel, but not above 71st parallel. So in order to have control above the 71st parallel, we need satellite. And those of you who know this first part of my story knows that it's extremely expensive with satellite systems. So it, it has been uh, it has been introductory contacts and uh, negotiations on Nordic cooperation on this issue, but I bet this will take some time because of the uh, the cost in uh, in uh, involved. Then we have Nordic cooperation on Arctic issues. Um, uh, this seems, when I say it here now, to be an easy task, but I can assure you it's not easy because there are no real tradition and no uh, agreements and regulations. <coughs> so I think we more or less start from scratch and that will definitely invite for difficult and hard uh, negotiations. And I hope sincerely that uh, we will agree between the Nordic countries on these issues. Uh, I have mentioned to you Nordic Resource Network to protect against cyber attacks. Disaster response unit. Uh, the, all the Nordic governments uh, did not go against it, but uh, it, uh, it proves that Hungary is, um, is building up such uh, a unit for NATO. And if that will work, fine. Uh, but it remains to be seen. And I, I tell you why I said this. I, I have been president of Red Cross in Norway, National Red Cross. And whenever we had an international disaster, we paid enormous sums to get an airplane or a ship. Because in, 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 in this area, it's a question of market prices. And when there is a disaster somewhere, the, the demand for planes are so great that the prices goes up and uh, much too much are spent on this uh, on these planes or boats so i hope that the nato uh, resource center in uh, hungary will work in this respect that means to actually work against the usual market prices if that is possible it remains to be seen uh, war Crimes Investigation Unit. I, I, I like to uh, mention that to you because it's interesting, at least for Nordic cooperation. <clears throat> uh, it, it seems simple because the, the Nordic countries are not used to deal with, um, with um, uh, war crimes. Uh, thank God we, are, we have, are not used to that. And then suddenly we have war crimes, uh, people who have escaped to the Nordic countries. And um, we, we need experience, and I suggest then here that we cooperate on this. That has not been very popular among the people who deals with this. And it's a very humane uh, uh, attitude, because you feel this is if you deal with war crimes in Norway, it's your case. Don't have Swedes or Danes or Finns into this. And this is one of the problems we have, generally speaking, but not at least on this particular issue. I trust that it will work out, but it will take time. Cooperation between foreign services. I, 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 I will be shorter now. Yeah, yeah yes. Five minutes, yeah. Uh, I'm sure we will finish by five minutes. Um, uh, well, I, I, let me take the practical example. 
when the end of the Cold War, in 1989, the Nordic foreign ministers, I was one of them at that time, agreed that because we had all the new states in, in the Soviet Union, we must have representation in Kazakhstan and in uh, Ukraine, etc. So we agreed now we should have Nordic cooperation. Everyone agreed. We, I think we even applauded each, each other. And then we gave a message to our ministers that it should be now planned for a Nordic embassy in Kiev. Very good. Uh, press liked it too. After one year we met and there was no plan, no uh, suggestion to us. Uh, so we got a bit irritated and we gave a message, now we need a plan immediately. So after uh, some months we got a plan. And that was a plan for Nordic cooperation on a garage, parking place in, in Kiev. And that would not, uh, was not our ambition. We had higher ambitions than that. And then, uh, right after this, we got the Nordic embassies in Berlin, moved from Bonn to Berlin, and that has worked out well. Uh, they're separate embassies, but on the same site and with a lot of common uh, areas within them. And it's a nice, very nice group of houses and it works well and I take bus now and then and I took a bus in Berlin and the bus driver shouted out next stop Nordische Botschaft. <laughs> and I was pretty proud. I thought that was a very nice compliment to us. And, and uh, the next thing may happen now, and I, I, I put some emphasis on this, because the cooperation in the foreign service between the Nordic countries has gone faster now and better than I expected when we started up. Um, yeah, so uh, the last is the military cooperation on transport, medical services, education, material and exercise ranges. That is working already. So, so uh, this is not, uh, not um, uh, a question mark. It will work, it does work. And then uh, recommendation number 12, amphibious unit. It's more difficult because the people in the amphibious units are very proud of their units, which is a fine thing. But they are so proud that they don't want to cooperate with others. And this is not on the Norwegian, because it's a typical Norwegian, but it's not on the Norwegian. It's applied to those Nordic countries who are involved with someone with Britain and Netherlands. Uh, I, I think one of these units are also in cooperation with uh, a unit in the um, Lithuania. I'm not sure, but I'm not trying to be polite, but uh, I, 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 I think there is a link also to the Baltic states. But it should not hinder us from trying to have a Nordic cooperation. That, that will serve all the Nordic countries. Now, dear friends, I have been through almost all the suggestions here. And if you, uh, if you miss some of this, you can ask me afterwards. Here, I will be here during the afternoon and in the evening, so I will sit here and answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stoltenberg. Now, uh, the extinguished members of parliament, excellencies, colleagues, friends, and students, the floor is open for Q&A session, questions and answer sessions. And uh, Mr. Stoltenberg said he liked blunt questions, straightforward questions. So 
he will not try to away from any of them. So be brave as you can. And uh, if I may start with using the, using the privilege as a moderator, I guess one of the most pressing and pestering questions here in the audience is, so where could or where is the Baltic question here in your Nordic outlook? Oh, uh, yes. It, it, yeah. The Baltic question is there the whole time because we come with a suggestion for the Nordic countries, but we have a reference to Baltic Watch, for instance, which is very important. But we cannot sit between five Nordic countries and decide what should the Baltic uh, do. But we can uh, indicate our interest in following up and then I think one of the important issues there is um, is the Baltic Watch. Okay. Now, before you ask a question or, or come up with a comment, please just state your name and your institutional affiliation. Yes, the Ambassador of Japan. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ambassador of Japan, and uh, I'm very happy to hear, I'm rather surprised to hear my country's name at the beginning of your lecture. I'm very proud of it. But actually, personally, I didn't know either about uh, Japan's uh, uh, research or experiment or, or uh, uh, examination about the, the ship going under uh, Bering oh, Strait, yeah. Bering Strait. Uh, we call it in Japanese Bering Kaikyo, <laughs> so a little bit different. So I didn't, uh, at the beginning I didn't catch it. But my question is, um, uh, you didn't touch upon it, but uh, uh, for Japan, Russia is also neighbor, our neighbor, long standing, long years. <laughs> and we have been working uh, for such a long time, such a long time, about our Northern Territory issues. And I've heard from my colleague, from Norwegian ambassador the other day, that no way uh, could solve the territorial issue after, only after 40 years. And, uh, only after 40 years. <laughs> only after 40 years. We are more than 60, 60 years. But um, uh, do you have any, any comment or opinion about our relation. Yeah. Can you hear me as well when I sit here? I don't know. Okay. okay. Can you hear me as well? Yes. Good. If not, tell me. Um, first, thank you for being honest and tell me that uh, you didn't know about this either because I was very much ashamed. Uh, but he was nice. He was a very nice man, and he for, have forgiven me, I, I hope. Uh, I had not contact with him the last years. Uh, uh, but uh, when it comes to uh, delimitation lines, border lines with Russia, I can only uh, say that for th I took part in this negotiation 30 years, and it didn't work well. I, I hope it was not due to me, but it didn't work. Uh, but then, when we made the Barents region agreement, it was many reasons for that. Uh, the main reason was that we wanted to contribute to turning an area of tension into an area of cooperation. And there was tension along all this uh, regional uh, regional uh, cooperation in Barents, in the Baltic, and uh, on Balkan. Now 17 countries on Balkan are cooperating too. And if this succeeds, and I believe when it comes to Barents and Baltic, it will, then we have actually turned an area of tension into an area of cooperation. Then the next step was uh, that the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister of Norway decided to, within the institution of Barents Corporation, to um, uh, try to build a personal relationship with Medvedev 
and and uh, with um, Lavro, and it worked. And uh, then we suddenly got the agreement, which has been of tremendous importance for us, but also for Russia, because now you can, within legal framework, start to work in these areas, particularly oil and gas. Thank you. Now the Member of Parliament, the Gidius Varekis, will ask a very short question or comment. Or both. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my question will be probably very short, but I'm not sure. Will your answer will be very short? I have the concern that after the Cold War, the European peoples, European people, the countries of Europe, they think that the world is a very safe place to live. Uh, my understanding is the world is a very dangerous place to live. And the Europeans, uh, what we have now, what the defense budget is declining, the, the, the defense industries are declining. The, the people, Europeans, simply they think that if they will say that we don't want war, nobody will start war. So what is your suggestion? How to persuade Europeans? not only NATO countries that you are representing, but the European Union countries, how to persuade people that the world is a dangerous place to live. And the people have to think about the defense, that the defense budget had not to be declined, not, not, not to go down, but to go up. So what is your suggestion? You're a very serious person. Tell people that the Thank you. world Thank is you, a Mr. dangerous we, place. We, we, got the point. we got the point. I, I, I go up there. Yeah. Let me first tell you or comfort you that I could give a longer and probably better speech how the world goes to hell. <laughs> yes, yeah, and most people uh, write about that and talk about it. But I, I have always believed that when I'm invited to talk about an issue and a problem, people will be interested to see how are the possibilities to solve this problem or meet this problem. And that's why I may now and then give the impression of being too optimistic. But that come, brings me to my second point. I, I will never have survived, and I really mean survived, in international affairs for 50, 60 years, if I didn't believe in what I hope for and hope what I believe in. This is the only way to try to meet the challenges. And then finally, I strongly believe that we are better off now, today, than, uh, than before the, when the Cold War was on. Uh, there are new dangers, I agree fully, but uh, I, I, I would like to meet the people who would prefer the Cold War. Uh, I, uh, it may be some, but I haven't met them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see two more hands. Let's start with the lady. Uh, my name is Sheyda Hanbay. I'm a Turkish diplomat. Uh, actually, the question will be a bit out of the context, but I apologize for that. Uh, actually, I really very much wonder about your valuable comments in this matter. I'm a diplomat, but I'm also currently uh, involved with an academic research on the involvement of uh, non-EU European allies in the European uh -huh. security and defense policy. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, as far as... Oh, yeah, now I heard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, as far as uh, uh, this involvement issue, Norway and Turkey has, uh, you know, some common backgrounds. So I would like to ask about the European Defense Agency. Uh, you know, after the transfer of the functions of the Western European Union into the EU, uh, the acquisitions of the uh, members uh, were said to be, you know, kept. And so um, Norway finalized its 
administrative arrangement documents with the EU in 2005, whereas it's still blocked <laughs> for some reasons, for political reasons actually for Turkey. So uh, how do you evaluate the uh, different treatment of these two you know, non-EU European allies? in terms of European Defense Agency. Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you very much. I can only uh, tell you my evaluation. Mm -hmm. And I... Uh, I think I speak loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you think I speak too loud, you must <laughs> give me notice. No, I, I really believe that if we do not take this opportunity we have now to integrate Turkey in the European cooperation on any level, I think we will do an historic mistake. Because I believe that Turkey will be as important for the future Europe as Germany was for the old Europe. Germany was a key in the east-west uh, contacts and work. And I think Turkey can be it in the north-south and not at least between uh, Islam and the Christian communities. So I'm strongly, strongly in favor of Turkey. And I, I take it up in all my lectures and speakers around. But I didn't know that you were Turkish. I would have started with that. <laughs> Okay, now I take one question from the floor and then I'm sure the students are preparing questions, especially those who are attending my course, the Nordic Studies. <laughs> yes, here's one question. <laughs> Head for the hills. Well, thank you. Uh, I am the, the charge at the uh, Canadian Embassy here in Vilnius, and it will become clear to you why I asked this question. Um, in your preparation for your report, in your research, and in your discussion with your Nordic uh, neighbors, did you detect a difference of priorities in security and defense among, on the one hand, those countries that actually border the Arctic Ocean, so Norway uh, and Denmark via Greenland, and the rest of them? Do they have, do these two sets of uh, Nordic countries have different priorities that, um, that showed up as you were researching the report? Uh, officially, no. <laughs> but, uh, but I uh, believe that both Denmark and Norway are more pushy and interested in these issues because we are a part of it. Uh, I think uh, Sweden and Finland in this respect may have other priorities, but they are definitely joining up. They are not being against it. But uh, will you give me two minutes? Because uh, since you are Canadian, I, I miss Canada. Uh, you don't have to answer this, but I, I, I need to say it. Because when I grew up in the Foreign Service, well, this was in the 50s, there was a link between Canada and the Nordic countries, particularly my country, Norway, which was unique. Whenever there was a crisis, there was our minister, Halvard Lange, foreign minister at that time, on the phone to Lester Persson. That was fantastic, and I missed this. Uh, so just say hello to the son or grandson of Lester Persson. Okay, thank you. And uh, more questions are flowing in. I see the forest of hands on the left-hand side of the auditorium. In the mean, yes, finally, thank you. Hello, my name is Thomas. I'm the student of this university, and I would like to ask a question about uh, the latest uh, electoral success of national parties in, in Nordic countries, and how this may affect the unity of Nordic countries if some national, nationalist ideas are spreading around, and how this further cooperation might be possible in the future. Thank you. Yes, this is a very pertinent question, and I regret that it's pertinent, but it is you telling the facts. And I'm very worried about it. Actually, uh, this is one of 
my deep personal concerns that you have people now in the Nordic countries who are repeating history in a way which I deeply regret. I hope we will manage uh, without uh, uh, these parties getting too much influence. Uh, 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 then it wouldn't be me if I don't answer you on a more optimistic note. Uh, in the sense that uh, the, 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 most, the most extreme nationalists do not as yet have great support. And those who are not extreme nationalists, they uh, ch seem to change policy. We have a party like this in Norway, Fremskis party. And they are much milder these days and much more uh, careful because they know that there is a limit what the Norwegian public opinion accepts. And they have not had the same progress as they had in the early stage. I hope this is a sign, and I hope this will have a contagious effect to other Nordic countries as well. Thank you. More questions to follow? If not, I might fill in the gap by asking uh, a question about one security area. Since the concept of security has broadened recently, and I have almost read all of your report, I noticed that uh, a special emphasis could be put on the energy security, which has become rather fashionable these days in the discussions on security discourses. And uh, it would be nice to hear the evaluation of energy security as one of the maybe missing elements in Nordic cooperation. Well, I, I tell you the reason why I didn't, I, it's not in my report at all, and I can tell you why. Because when I had this round uh, trip regularly with the Nordic countries, it seemed that the Nordic countries were actively working on this issue, all of them, for, uh, all five of them, and, uh, and, and also in cooperation with Baltic countries. So I felt uh, in my report, I didn't want to take in the obvious thing. I was actually asked by the five Nordic governments to uh, be visionary and a little bit uh, irresponsible. That's probably why they asked me to do it. <laughs> okay, one more question. Sharuna uh, Trudelavich. The mic is over there. My name is Sharuna Sredlajus and I'm uh, working for the Nordic Council of Ministers office here in Vilnius. So my question will be related to that. Uh, right now the uh, Nordic Council, the cooperation, the Nordic cooperation within the Nordic Council of Ministers and Nordic Council, it does not take the, the defense issues. Uh, do you think there is a need for any institutional change in the cooperation that uh, that the uh, cooperation on issues of defense should be taken into some other level between the Nordic countries, or you think that it's, this situation uh, is, is sufficient for cooperation? I think this situation is sufficient in the sense that um, during the Cold War, we could not discuss foreign policy either. Uh, we uh, had um, uh, uh, we should not take up foreign policy or security issues. Then in 92, uh, there was a decision that we should have the first foreign policy report for a foreign minister. It, that means as an introduction to a debate on the issue. And this foreign policy uh, introduction if you read them, you see there are not a distinct difference between foreign policy and security policy. So I think this will come. It's, it's already there. And then if you make a suggestion of institutionalizing this, I think we may actually slow the process than if we let it go by via the foreign policy introduction. Okay, and maybe 
the last question because our time is running out. And you should know that if you, I have a very rare situation because I'm in quite a few meetings like this, but then I'm in the public and we are urged to come with a question and I, I, I simply cannot come up with questions because I, I, I don't think of a question that. Then one hour after the meeting, I, I come on with a very good question. And I suppose that I'm not alone with this, this problem. Then you can call me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, call the embassy, they will uh, transmit your questions to me. And, and the worst thing is that people call me. So, <laughs> yes, they do. So, so my wife is asked quite often if it's not a pity to have a husband who is always away traveling. And she does not reply the way people expect, but she say, no, it's not difficult. Why? Because I take it as a relaxation when he's away. So <laughs> that's why, because of all the telephone calls. Yes, finally an inspiring statement, Mr. Stoltenberg, and one hand shot to the ear, so. Uh, good day, my name is Gintas, I'm a student in this institute. I would uh, like you to ask one question. Uh, sometime last year in a conference, David Cameron, uh, the Prime Minister of the United K, was asked by a journalist, do we trust France enough to cooperate with them in military affairs? So my question would be similar. Do the Nordic states trust the Baltic states enough to cooperate in such, a, I would say, crucial um, issues like uh, defense? And if so, then why? What's, uh, uh, what makes you trust the Baltic States? Thank you. You know, I, I, I don't think this is a question of, of trusting. This is a question of strategy. Uh, it, it's more difficult to get the agreement on all these 13 points with Nordic cooperation. So I think if you include at this stage the Baltic, it will be no cooperation at all. It will not work because, uh, because uh, after all, when we have Nordic meeting, we speak our own language. And if we then go to the English language, it does not facilitate the closeness and the possibilities to get an achievement. So when people, you are not the first one to ask me this question. And my standard answer is, let now the Nordic countries try to see if we really manage to agree. And then you should raise your question, not with me, because I have no say in Norwegian political affairs, but take it with the government and via the embassy. So the ambassador will be busy. <laughs> And if I may take a privilege again to ask the very last question, and uh, I, I want to, to be blunt, may I? It, it concerns Iceland. Would you say that uh, the Nordic political elites and high-ranking officials in the Nordic countries have followed your commandment number 13 to show Nordic solidarity when Iceland became trapped between its referendum on not compensating the savings and the demands from the British and the Dutch governments? Yes.